pelicosaurs were primitive synapsids with differentiated teeth and a hard palate. Therapsids were mammal-like reptiles possessing complex jaws and teeth. Their legs were vertically attached under their bodies, as opposed to laterally at their sides. In the proto-mammals, we see further development of mammalian skull characteristics. At last we arrive at early placentals. They were small and rodent-like organisms. So what about marsupials and monotremes? They diverged previously to the advent of placentals. In the case of marsupials, there exists a fairly strong fossil record. In the case of monotremes, we know them mostly from their jaws. Returning to placentals, early primates are known largely by their skull fragments and jaws. In this case, they still did not look much like modern primates, except that their teeth began to take on primate-like characters. We know the ancestors to Old World primates largely by their jaws and skull fragments, both of which lead to the conclusion that brain size was increasing, while the length of its nose was decreasing. Propylopithecus is an early ape known by its jaw. Its teeth became a defining characteristic for apes. Egyptopithecus is an anthropoid ape possessing a much larger and rounder brain. Proconsul possesses features of both apes and monkeys. This is also where we begin to observe sexual dimorphism. Kenyapithecus, a descendant of Proconsul, is an ancestor to great apes and humans. Australopithecus afarensis was a slender and ape-like organism. It was also bipedal. Australopithecus africanus was even more slender than afarensis and possessed a larger brain. Its teeth possess similar characteristics as those found in species of the genus Homo. At long last, we arrive at humans. Homo habilis straddles the Australopithecine Homo boundary. It possessed a larger brain and is associated with the first primitive stone tools. However, it may represent two distinct species of Homo. Homo erectus had a much larger brain and a thick brow ridge. It is associated with much better stone tools, as well as the first use of fire. Archaic Homo sapiens possessed a brain size intermediate to H. erectus and modern humans. They also possessed a much less robust skeleton and teeth than their predecessors. Homo sapiens sapiens are modern humans. While our brain size has increased in comparison to archaic Homo sapiens, our skeletal and muscular system is less robust. Now, we know you're all asking, what about Neanderthals? Well, Homo neanderthalensis was a side lineage. They were very successful for a time, but they've gone extinct. Based on the current evidence, they did not contribute to the genome of modern humans. So what they've done is they've come up with a very crafty alternative to the Darwinian concept of evolution. They call it punctuated equilibrium. Punctuated equilibrium is a hypothesis which was put forward by the late Dr. Stephen Jay Gould and Dr. Niles Eldridge. In simplicity, punctuated equilibrium hypothesizes that evolution can occur in rapid bursts with slow anagenic change occurring during the interim. The theory says evolution is stable for long periods of time. Then new species suddenly come into being and others immediately become extinct. Dr. Gould was a master of communicating his ideas to the public. As such, we feel that the response to this atrocious mischaracterization can best be answered by Dr. Gould's own explanation of his hypothesis. A new species can arise when a small segment of the ancestral population is isolated at the periphery of the ancestral range. Large, stable, central populations exert a strong homogenizing influence. New and favorable mutations are diluted by the sheer bulk of the population through which they must spread. They may build slowly in frequency, but the changing environments usually cancel their selective value long before they reach fixation. Thus, phyletic transformation in large populations should be very rare, as the fossil record proclaims. But small, peripherally isolated groups are cut off from their parental stock. They live as tiny populations in geographic corners of the ancestral range. Selective pressures are usually intense because the peripheries mark the edge of the ecological tolerance for the ancestral forms. Favorable variations spread quickly. 
Small peripheral isolates are a laboratory of evolutionary change. What should the fossil record include if most evolution occurs by speciation in peripheral isolates? Species should be static through their range because our fossils are the remains of large central populations. In any local area inhabited by ancestors, a descendant species should appear suddenly by migration from the peripheral region in which it evolved. In the peripheral region itself, we might find direct evidence of speciation, but such good fortune would be rare indeed because the event occurs so rapidly in such a small population. Thus, the fossil record is a faithful rendering of what evolutionary theory predicts, not a pitiful vestige of a once bountiful tale. You see, this solves all kinds of problems intellectually for the evolutionists. Not at all. The idea was not even very novel. Charles Darwin, as well as Alfred Russell Wallace, among others, proposed similar ideas. The difference is that Dr. Gould stressed peripheral population. He doesn't have to look at the fossil record. Comically enough, Dr. Gould was, and Dr. Eldridge is, a paleontologist by training. And both have studied the fossil record extensively. I'm convinced that the idea of punctuated equilibria is really a desperate attempt to salvage evolutionary theory. We are convinced. That was an appeal to ridicule. Punctuated equilibrium is an explanation of some of the observations in the fossil record. There is no evidence in the fossil record that one type of animal ever changed into another type of animal. Do you still remember those transitional fossils that we covered previously? Punctuated equilibria comes along and says that isolated populations of animals evolved rapidly and left no fossil trace. No. It stated that isolated populations evolve rapidly, and finding fossils from the small peripheral population would be a challenge. But this is an argument from lack of data. There are no transitional forms, and that's used then as proof of the brand of evolution called punctuated equilibria. According to creationists, this does not exist. This is bad science. We agree. The caliber of research being conducted by the ICR is atrocious. We are skipping the hatchet job on Dr. Richard Goldschmidt. Dr. Goldschmidt's saltationism hypothesis was rejected long ago, and insulting him at this stage is just too childish. It seems like almost every new development in science is converging to destroy evolution. And that's true. It is a blatant lie. Regardless of whether we're talking about new discoveries in astronomy... Astronomy is not evolutionary biology or paleontology or biology, this is true. No, evolutionary biology is the foundation of modern biology. In the last decade, most of the basic pillars upon which evolution has stood have collapsed, and the theory is now in chaos. It's anarchy, I tell you, anarchy. Researchers are burning down labs, textbooks are being burned in mass, graduate students are spontaneously combusting. Anarchy. No, wait. Miss Folger is lying. Again. Unfortunately, at this time, the evolutionists are crying louder than ever before that evolution is a fact. Actually, most biologists completely ignore creationists. Parents, however, cry rather loudly when creationists try to supplant science with their religion in the public classroom. And well, way to go, parents. You should. If evolution was true, wouldn't be concerned about the extinction of species. There'd be new ones being created. Speciation events are happening. Extinction is a concern because once a population is gone, it's gone forever. Also, someone should email Chuck Misler and inform him that an extinct population cannot undergo further divergence. We don't have two species. Why is Mr. Misler denying a well-known fact? We got deterioration. Who came up with that conclusion? Simply because life is not adapting as you see fit does not equate with deterioration. We have all kinds of species that no longer exist. This is known as extinction. It is a prediction of evolutionary biology. That just does not even make sense. If something has been found, it can no longer be described as missing. Words have meaning for a purpose. 